So the Tallgrass Prairie Center isn't a like museum or nature center. We do a lot of research and practical applications. So there is a lot of cool things to see here, but most of them um, we do applied research and applied conservation around um, in Northeast Iowa. So just so you know, even though we are a nature, we aren't a nature center, um, you're still more than willing to see the trails and the production plots that are around us. But yeah. We do have a seminar series starting in January. It's not the same as Botany Beginners, um, but we cover a, a wide variety of topics, all prairie related, and those are recorded and I believe available on our website. Hopefully we can maybe see you in person during that time, but we will wait and see. Um, welcome everyone. Laura Walter will now get started on our third, is it our third already? Oh my gosh. Our third segment of Botany Beginners. Thank you all for joining us. I'll be monitoring the Q&A the best I can. Um, but without further ado, Laura Walter. Hi, um, I'm so happy to be here tonight to deliver uh, uh, this uh, third in the webinar series um, called Tips for Becoming an Expert Botanist. So we're gonna take you along the next steps in your journey of becoming um, really well-versed in your plants and knowing how to learn your plants. So um, there's a little bit about me on, on this blurb here, um, but some other background is that um, I've been identifying plants since I was a small child. Uh, my mom was into foraging and she took me along with her uh, to a foraging class at Colorado State University when I was five years old. Um, and I still remember some of what I learned uh, in that experience and enjoy eating some of the, the weeds that grow in my garden as well. Uh, and then throughout my life, plants have been an interest and uh, also a solace and a joy uh, and an inspiration. So I'm very excited to, to share that appreciation with you. Um, and hopefully this will become a lifelong interest of yours. And whatever your age, gender, your race, you know, the nature is out there for you. Um, and I hope that it uh, can also function in your life the way it has in mine. The other reason why I, I really think this is important is that um, we take care of the things that we know about. And uh, if you learn those plants and you get deeply versed in the plant communities around you, you are going to become a steward of those areas in which they grow. And I feel that that's important that all of us, we, we uh, depend on nature um, and it depends on us as well. So um, welcome uh, along this journey and um, here we go. So uh, I wanna thank, first of all, um, some of our partners and sponsors. Um, we're uh, receiving generous help from Practical Farmers of Iowa in um, putting out these courses. Um, and also uh, we are housed at the University of Northern Iowa, um, which um, helps provide support for our programs. Uh, we are very grateful for the help and assistance and involvement of members of AmeriCorps, in particular Paige, shout out to her for um, all of the work that she's done on developing this course. And of course we are the Tallgrass Prairie Center. So here are a couple more thank yous and then also some reminders. So I want to thank all of you um, for your enthusiasm. The, the fact that you want to learn more about plants just brings me a lot of hope um, and, uh, and just makes me excited about the future. Um, I want to thank the UNI Information Technology staff for helping us um, with the technical aspects of these webinars and the recordings and making those available to you. And also, of course, the Paige and Stacey, who are um, right now kind of behind the scenes, um, but who've been very involved in all of this and are helping me today with um, your questions and comments. Some reminders are that the June 8th and 11th webinars, uh, the recordings of those have now been posted. If you go to Botany Beginners at the Tallgrass Prairie Center website, um, you can look under Botany Resources and you'll find the recordings and some other things that can help you there. The first quiz is going to be posted soon. Don't get nervous. It's going to be auto graded. You'll know um, how many you got right right away. Um, and hopefully we can get you some feedback on, on the, the answers that were more difficult. Um, if you haven't already done so, if you go to the Botany Beginners page on the Tallgrass Prairie Center website, you'll see there's a survey there. We'd like to know more about you. And you can get to know each other by connecting on the, uh, the uh, Botany Beginners Facebook group. So there you just search Facebook for Botany Beginners and you simply ask to join the group. 
Also, I would uh, recommend if you have, lo have lots of questions about general um, aspects of prairies and um, resources for managing prairies or starting your own, uh, please visit the Tallgrass Prairie Center uh, website and look on the resources section. There's a lot of information there. So just kind of returning to sort of the goals and um, objectives of the course. So why are you here? Um, because we want to help you learn how to learn plants. So I'm not going to walk you through and tell you the names of all the plants I know that really wouldn't help you um, in your explorations of your environment. So what we're going to do is help you learn the names of plants that are important to you by helping you get comfortable with botanical language and the use of field guides. Uh, we hope that this leads you to a greater appreciation of Iowa's natural areas because you can explore them and find the plants and name those plants that you find in those areas. And we also help, uh, hope that it helps you feel like you're um, becoming part of a community of other plant lovers across the state. So as you know, the course has several components. The first are the six lectures. If you haven't yet watched the first two lectures, um, please know that I'm going to be relying a lot on the learning from those two lectures in uh, what I'm going to be delivering tonight. So if, this, if you're watching live tonight um, and some of it isn't making sense, go back and, and listen to the recordings of the previous lectures and I think it'll all come together for you. Um, remember those, um, sorry, I want to say also that those, um, those lectures, the recordings are available once again on the Botany Resources page. It's under Botany Beginners at the Tallgrass Prairie Center website. Um, we will be learning plants of the day in uh, each of the lectures, and I'd encourage you to maintain your own plant list and uh, start um, collecting. It's like your repertoire for a musician. Um, one of the things that is, um, I think why I like to learn the names of things is because it helps me feel more connected to them. It, it's just like if you walk into a, a huge room and it's full of people you don't know, um, it's kind of intimidating. Uh, and if you walk into a natural area and you don't know anything about it, it can be kind of scary. You might have heard things about plants that can give you allergies or rashes and things and you don't know what to stay away from and what you can actually, you know, like rub and smell and, and, and engage with. So that's what we're hoping to do for you is to help you to develop your list of names. So when you walk into that prairie, you're like, oh, there's my friend so-and-so and there's toad flax. And, you know, you're just going to you're going to go out there and you're going to know um, who you're talking to. Uh, there will be some homework and quizzes. These are just to help you review and refresh the, the information that you'll be learning. And we hope to focus those on some of the important concepts and ideas. Uh, please uh, enjoy the Facebook group. I know there have been a lot of people posting on there. It's a place where you can share what you found. Um, we're very excited about your discoveries and you can even brag a little bit. There's a bragging rights for the, the mystery plants today um, will be part of that. Later on this summer, um, we'll add the virtual field days um, to our, uh, our schedule. So you'll be able to see those popping up on the calendar. Those should be in July. And the Newcomb's Wildflower Guide is the, um, is the required text for the course. Um, I'll have some tips for what to do if you don't have Newcomb's on hand. Um, but if you've got your copy, make sure that it's ready. Um, we'll be using it tonight. So uh, this is, like um, Paige said, it's the third in our series. Uh, Paige led us off with an introduction to the course. Laura Jackson followed up with Botany Fundamentals and um, a kind of a deep dive into how to use the Newcomb's Field Guide. I'll be helping you um, get some tips for really upping your game as a botanist. Uh, next week, it'll be Justin Meissen and Christine Nemec helping you learn some of the common plants of CRP plantings and roadsides. And then I'll be back with Justin uh, as we talk about remnant prairie plants. And finally, uh, Paige will wrap it all up and, and talk with you about continuing your own botanical journey. So um, here's what we've learned in some of the previous lectures. Uh, the first thing was an overview of the Botany Beginners course and uh, some of the basic terminology for describing plants, like the leaf arrangements that are shown here from uh, Newcomb's Guide. Uh, Paige also discussed safety while botan botanizing. And, I'd like to highlight that right now, uh, what we're noticing out in the field is that it's a really good year if you happen to be a bot fly, not so great if you happen to be something that bot flies find tasty. I mean, not bot flies, um, deer flies that they, they find um, tasty. So uh, protecting yourself from the deer flies uh, would be useful this year. Uh, Laura Jackson uh, brought up other field guides that you might use and compared them to Newcomb's Guide. And then she also introduced some plants of the day and used those to practice with Newcomb's Wildflower Guide. So I'd uh, like to uh, refresh your memory on what this particular plant is. And there's a little hint in the picture in that 
one of the creatures that is resting on that flower is part of the name. I wonder if people are saying in the chat what they think that flower is. They think it's spiderwort. That's awesome. And there's a little jumping spider there eating a hoverfly right on the plant. So that's one of the plants of the day from previous things. And if you remembered your spiderwort, I'm, um, I'm super excited. So today we'll be taking it a step further. So um, we will be doing more practice with Newcomb's Wildflower Guide, but I'm going to kind of accelerate it um, so that um, each time I won't walk you through quite as many of the steps um, and uh, we'll, we'll get a little bit more fluent with our use of that. Um, I'm also going to help you find some of the current common and scientific names that are accepted uh, in use. So um, some of you have mentioned that Newcomb's looks like it's kind of an older field guide. Well, it's an old and good field guide, but there are some of the names that have changed. And we'll talk about why that is and help you find resources to get the currently accepted common names and scientific names. We'll start learning about plant families. And um, hopefully by the end of this, you'll be able to recognize four of the most common plant families of the prairie. And then we'll go through some um, help for troubleshooting some identification issues that you could run into. And you will learn four new species of the day. So if you don't have your Newcomb's Guide, I would recommend just follow along and um, remember your botany terms and apply them to today's plants. Uh, if you are one of those advanced people in our group who has a lot of, um, already a lot of knowledge of plant names, um, kind of have your notebook handy. There will be 15 mystery plants kind of plopped in throughout the, the presentation and, um, and you can, if you get them all, all 15, you could uh, post your, um, even if you get several of them, post that on Facebook, share it, brag about yourself. Um, you could also today be learning about online tools that you can use that will help supplement Newcombs and any other field guide that you happen to use. And you'll learn about several important species that are not found in a Newcombs guide. So the web resources that we're going to be using today include um, three, uh, well, we'll be using two websites and then there's another one I threw in there because I like it. Um, the first one is USDA Plants Database. This is where we'll be going to find the currently accepted plant names. Uh, Minnesota Wildflowers um, is very useful for identifying uh, identification of species. Um, they have an excellent um, uh, way of searching for um, species using the characteristics that you've learned about through your botanical terminology. And then finally, the one that I just like, so I'm throwing it in there, is Illinois Wildflowers. Um, this one provides a lot of ecological information about uh, the species in, in prairies and woodlands and wetlands. Um, it also is a little bit tricky. And when you go to the homepage of that um, website, the search bar is clear at the bottom. So just uh, know that they do have a search bar. Um, you just have to, have to find it. So I used to be a teacher. And oftentimes, I would tell kids to set their cell phones aside. But if you've got your cell phone on you tonight, um, I'd like you to get it out and use it. Um, you can follow along and try using the sites. So I know you can't access the links by looking at a, a webinar and you can't shoot your phone at it or something. But what you can do is Google the titles and they're easy to find. Uh, if you type in USDA plants database, you'll find it. If you type in Minnesota wildflowers, you'll find it. So we're going to start practicing with, uh, with Newcomb's Guide. This is our plant of the day number one. So the first thing I want you to do is um, find the fly leaf um, of your book. So that, that loose paper that's the, the first paper page you find uh, inside the front of your cover. And it should have this chart that's called the three classifications. Um, and we're going to find the group number of uh, this, uh, this first plant of the day. So here's the flower of our plant of the day. Um, I'd like you to identify the flower type and then put your answer in the chat. And Paige will let me know um, when we've got some answers for that. We're saying irregular. We're hearing a lot of irregular. Um, I'm really pleased with that. That's, uh, that's what I'm seeing as well. So I agree with you. So um, we have an irregular flower. What about the plant type? Now this is a little tricky because I'm only showing you a single leaf and how it attaches to the stem. But uh, please identify it is, um, it's not a shrub, it's not a tree or vine, it's uh, an herbaceous plant. Um, so in the chat, what is the plant type? Alternate wildflower. We've got an alternate wildflower? Awesome. Um, I think I, I want to point out, if anybody was sitting on their hands and, and waiting, since we have just the one leaf sitting there, and there's not another one coming off the opposite side of the stem at that node, that's clearly an alternate leaf. So you guys are, are wonderful. I wouldn't try to trick you with anything like that. 
So the leaf type, uh, you might have gone ahead and done that next, um, but uh, if you haven't, go ahead and answer the leaf type in the chat. Um, we have entire mm -hmm. world um, divided. divided. Okay. okay, so we're having a lot, some different answers, Paige is telling me. So um, a lot of people are saying divided, and um, uh, but we have also had some people say um, entire or world. And so I'd like to talk about those, those three terms a little bit. Um, in uh, this case, we already talked about the leaf arrangement. So where the leaf connects to the stem, you can see there's a little bud. Uh, and there's no other leaf um, uh, next to it, and there's certainly not um, more than two leaves at that, at that node. So what we have here is an alternate leaf arrangement. So world isn't an option anymore because um, we have alternate leaves. So that leaves us with entire versus divided. Um, and I would say that we have a single leaf here that has three leaflets that make it up. So there's no buds at the basis of these, so therefore um, these are leaflets within a single leaf. The leaflets themselves are entire, they don't have teeth. And so that's something that you could be in a detail that you, um, that you add. But when we're doing just the three classifications in the fly leaf, it's not going quite to that level of detail. So, so far we have an irregular flower, we have an alternate um, leaf type in, or in this, or sorry, plant type in this, um, this wildflower, and we have divided leaves. So our group number would be 134. So let's see where that takes us. We use the group number in the locator key to help us find the page number in the field guide. So go to page two of, of Newcombs and we'll work through um, what, getting to the right page number. So you should find a place on page two where it says 134, irregular flowers, wildflowers with alternate leaves, and leaves divided. So here, um, the first choice that's indented below that um, gives us uh, three different choices. It says leaflets three, entire or finely toothed. And that seems to match our plant pretty well, but let's look at the other choices anyway. Leaflets four or more, entire or finely toothed, or leaf, leaves deeply cleft into irregularly lobed or very narrow segments. Well, that one doesn't match. We've, got, we've definitely got divided um, leaves. So um, we're going to go with that first one, that uh, top um, option. And then beneath that, indented just below it, we have yellow flowers or flowers not yellow. If you look at the flower picture below, um, those are either a little tiny bit of a cream tinge to them, but certainly not yellow. So um, we're going to go with the second option there, flowers not yellow. There's no page number right next to that. The page number is attached to the yellow flowers option, so we still have to keep going. So let's look at the next choices indented below that. It gives us middle leaflet stalkless, or nearly so, or middle leaflet uh, distinctly stalked. Um, why don't you tell me in the chat what you think it is? I'm going to go ahead and open the next choices below that just to see what the full key says. So we're seeing a lot of stalkless, and I would agree with you. So um, if the middle leaflet is stalkless or nearly so, that leaves us with, with page 60 in Newcomb's Guide. So let's go there. Why don't we? Okay, so here's page 60, um, and this should get us to a plausible ID. Um, now, I see a lot of text on the left side, I see pictures on the right, my brain goes immediately to looking at the pictures. And if I look at the picture of our flower, and I look at that page, I already have a question mark forming in my mind. It could be that one. And that one, um, I've clipped off the text at the bottom of that page, but if you're on page 60, you'll see that it says blue false indigo. So we're going to look over on the left at the false indigos, the baptisias. And they're blue or white flowers, about one, each lo one each inch long in loose racemes. And a raceme is one of those flower arrangements that Paige told us about in the first lecture, where each of the flowers sits on a little stalk called a peduncle, which is one of Paige's favorite words. So um, underneath the false indigos, there are two of them. There's blue false indigo and white false indigo. And I'm just going to let you guess as to which one of those is and then put it in a nice green box for you. Um, I think this is white false indigo. 
Now, you'll notice that the false indigos are called Baptisia. That's the genus name for this, um, this group of plants. And then below that, there are two different species of Baptisias, and then they kind of abbreviate the name. So white false indigo is, is given as B. leucantha. The B, of course, just stands for Baptisia. So, you know, this is a plausible identification, but we know that Newcombs doesn't have every plant that could possibly be in Iowa. So let's kind of, we're going to go out to Google and, and look at what, what Google says about Baptisia leucantha. Well, Google gives us a lot of results, and the first four say Baptisia leucantha, nice Chicago Botanic Garden, nice um, reference there. Baptisia alba, Prairie Moon Nursery, they usually have their stuff, right? What's the deal here? Baptisia leucantha, Baptisia alba, which one is it? Okay, we're going to solve this mystery using one of the websites that I mentioned before. So, ah, a green arrow, missing. I, I um, thought I had all those things uh, um, figured out. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the USDA plants um, website, and I'll take you out there in just a little bit. Um, but I want to look at the steps that we're going to use once we get there. We're going to type the scientific name of the plant in the search bar, uh, bar um, and then we're going to see what the result is. So let's go ahead and follow this screen. It means I have to play around here a little bit and find out where this is. That's what I'm trying to do. Um, I'm trying to get out to Google. Let's see where, where we go from here. Oh, we are in the right place. Okay. So I'm going to type the scientific name into that, that search bar. And I've done this before, so it's going to auto-populate for me. And we're going to hit go. And where we land is on Baptisia alba. And so this is the USDA plants database. They're kind of a, uh, an authority on um, uh, the, the plants of uh, the United States. Um, and so you'll see their names in use in lots of things, like the NRCS uses the names that are accepted here. So Baptisia alba is the accepted name for our plant. Um, and the accepted common name is large leaf wild indigo. Another bit of useful information that you see is it gives us a range map. Um, some people pointed out uh, in the first uh, lesson that Newcomb's, um, we're kind of on the borderline of what would be in, actually covered in Newcomb's guide, but you can see here that Baptisia alba is found it's native in Iowa, so that map can be helpful. If you look at the tabs across the top, we're right, right now in the general information, you can find other images at, at a tab, and there's also synonyms, and just like in English where synonyms um, mean uh, different words that mean the same thing, here you can look at the different names that this plant has had um, as the taxonomists have learned more about it. So Baptisia leucantha is one of those synonyms that helps confirm that we've got the right identification. So um, we're going to go back to our, um, our PowerPoint. Okay, so we click go and we found out that the current accepted name is Baptisia alba. So now you know about one of those web resources that we have. So let's talk a little bit about scientific names in general, because it is sort of weird that people say, yeah, use the scientific name because it's more consistent, and then they sometimes change. So the format of a scientific name is just uh, the genus that the plant belongs in, and then its species. The genus is more general. It includes um, multiple related uh, species. Um, so you can kind of remember it by the, the first three letters are gen or role. Um, the plural of genus is genera, which sounds even more like that. And then a species is more specific. And so the first part of that also sounds like what it means. Uh, genera are these are, are really familiar categories to us. Um, if you know what an oak is, you know a genus. If you know what, what roses are, you know a genus. Same with clovers. So I've uh, put a picture here of page 60 in Newcombs, which includes three clovers that are in the genus Trifolium. And one of the things that you'll notice in Newcombs, because it's um, the classification works according to similar characteristics, Several species in a genus may be on the same page because they share that set of characteristics. One of the things that happens in taxonomy is that we do, when we get new evidence that results in a revision of the taxonomy and so that um, causes renaming of the plants. It's kind of annoying to those of us who have to learn them um, over again, uh, but it, it reflects a better understanding of the relationships between this, these plants through their evolution. So first botany break. 
Um, uh, this is a chance to check in with some questions, and I want to remind those expert botanists out there that there are going to be 15 numbered plants throughout the, um, the lesson tonight, and this is number one. No questions so far? Someone's tweeting and already wanted to add these plants. Ooh! So everyone should get this plant right if they got it right. Well, Okay. All right. This one's very tricky. Um, uh, I would be surprised. Um, it's a tough one to get to species without being um, able to look at it very closely. All right. I think we can move on. Now. Okay. Awesome. All right. So um, we've looked at what a genus is and what a species, uh, how a species fits within a genus, and now we're going to look at a higher level. Um, so we're going to—I uh, just want you to look at all of these pictures that I'm going to show you, and tell me what you think they have in common. Experts out there, there's going to be some numbered pictures in here too, um, so uh, keep your eyes peeled for those those red numbers. Um, so um, think about what these things uh, have in common, and um, when you start to notice things you can um, you can put those things in the chat please not the ids so that other people have that the sense of mystery um, but uh, the characteristics that you notice that they have in common so far we have compound leaves divided leaves entire leaflets divided Ooh. leaves divided leaves what's the divided leaves um, pinnate or oddly pinnate Oh my goodness, all the words are so cool. Oh my goodness, are you guys, you can, you can all see the chat, I imagine, right? Everybody can see it. So you can see what other people are posting and um, there's all of this vocabulary is coming out. I love the entire leaflets, the, you know, uh, pinnately divided or compound, uh, you know, all these terms. Oh, how about this one? And you've seen this before today. And how about that? Oh, I heard the word legume, so that'll, that'll come up in just a second. Irregular. Irregular flowers, awesome. Okay, thank you, Paige. Okay, so um, uh, you know that uh, some, some people have already said that these are the legumes, and so I'm calling that another name for the pea family, and it's down here on the slide. So plants in this family um, are uh, one of the, the best families to learn to identify right off the bat because they have a suite of characteristics that's pretty, pretty much common to all of them. Um, they usually have irregular flowers. There are a couple of exceptions. Um, they have, they generally have divided leaves, although I can think of one exception and maybe you can too. That would, hey, that would be a good challenge question. Um, they uh, generally have alternate leaves and their fruits are pods, like pea pods or beans. So these are the legumes. Um, the scientific name for them is the Fabaceae. You'll see this ace to e ending on all the, the family names that we look at tonight. And um, these are extremely important plants um, in uh, all ecosystems, and, including prairies, for their ability to coexist with uh, bacteria in their root systems that take nitrogen from the atmosphere and make it into uh, forms that the plants can use. And then they are the basis for the proteins in our bodies. And, and um, life on Earth uh, would be very different without the legumes. So what is this, this idea of a plant family? So uh, legumes are one plant family. A family is a group of genera that are more closely related to each other in an evolutionary sense than to other genera. So it's really not that different from our own um, conception of the word family, because you know that you're more closely related to the members of your family than you are to the members of someone else's family. So it's kind of a, a, a neat little intuitive way of thinking about it. Uh, families often have characteristics that go together, uh, but they don't always go together in exactly the same way. So um, there, there are going to be exceptions to all of these. However, they're, they're a wonderfully useful shortcut to recognition. So even though you could go out into the field and you could take iNaturalist app with you and you could take a snap of pic a picture of things um, and you could get a body of knowledge of, of different species names that way, when you know your families, you have something to connect all of um, the, the plant species you know to. It's, it's um, a really useful way of organizing them, and it's how one, many field guides are organized. So I think of it kind of like this. Um, and to my colleagues, I want to say, if you're watching, um, I did have to stage this. My desk is not actually that messy. 
But you all know that person who has the desk that's just got the stacks of papers everywhere and the post-it notes on everything. And, and yet they say, oh, I know where everything is. Don't touch it. Um, knowing a lot of plant names is kind of like that. But when you start to know the families, it's like you got a filing system and you can put the new species that you learn into those filing systems. And when you find something new you, or, or you're confused about it, you pull out the folder and you flip through it and you're like, oh yeah, okay. So um, that's why we're gonna get into plant families. So there are four important plant families we'll cover tonight. We already did the legumes. Hey, we're, you know, one down, three to go. We'll also talk about the composites. They're the Asteraceae. Um, it has aster in its name, like, like the aster um, plants. Sedges or the Cyperaceae, that's a great word to say. And the grasses are the simplest to say. They're the Poaceae, and I love that word too. Uh, many prairie plant species are in these four families. They kind of dominate the prairie system. There are other important families like the mid family and the milkweed family, and especially we insect people, we like to know about those because they're important hosts to insects. But um, we're going to cover those four for tonight. So the composites are going to go first. And here I have a daisy um, flower for my garden that I've partially dissected. And um, first off, plants in this family have heads. So that's kind of a weird word for the top of a plant. But I guess my head's still attached to the top of me, so maybe it isn't so weird. Um, they have extremely reduced flowers. Um, and in botany, a lot of scientific areas, if you have something that's very tiny, you stick an ET ending on it. So it's just a floret. Hey, it's a cool, cute little word. Um, there are two types of florets within this daisy. There are disc florets. If you think about, I like to think about the sun, it has a disc and then it has the rays that shine out from it. So, hey, we've got disc florets, we've got ray florets. It's kind of really nice intuitive um, words. All of these florets are very tightly packed on the expanded end of the stem. And expanded end of stem is a kind of a clunky phrase. So we have a word for that, of course, because botany always does that. Um, and that's the receptacle. It's like the receiving end of the stem. And all of this packed together appears as a single flower to us and to bees and to butterflies and hoverflies and all the insects that visit um, flowers. So there are um, three main types of composite heads. Uh, kind of the classic one that's similar to the daisy has both the rays and the disc florets. And Newcombs ha has most of these within the regular flowers. So um, they're not kind of making you learn that, um, that the, how the heads are different. So um, down below that number six has both ray and disc florets. Uh, some composites have only ray florets. So um, the number seven here as your mystery plant um, has a, a head that's made of only ray florets. Dandelions are also like that. And then some others have only disc florets. And uh, Newcombs would call these indistinguishable. And so plant eight, mystery plant eight over there, um, is like that. It has only disc florets. So plant of the day number two, we're ready for that, I think, um, is this beautiful little daisy-like um, flower. You could correct me on that if you want. Uh, here is uh, an example of it. And up close so for you to look at to help in your identification. We're going to start with the group number. Um, and um, I think you could probably see that it has seven or more parts to that flower. Maybe, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, and you can see uh, then some of the leaf and stem characteristics that you need in the picture beside that. So um, use the front fly leaf. Um, and go into the chart and um, get us your three-digit group number so we can get to the right page. We have 733 is our first one. Mm -hmm. 733. We're getting lots of 733s. Oh my goodness, we all agree the system is working. And as, as it always does when you know what you're doing, right? So um, let's go to um, uh, the locator key and look at um, 733 and see what we find. So I'm seeing that the leaves are toothed. The flowers are not yellow or orange. 
Um, and then our next two choices are daisy-like or aster-like flowers versus flowers not daisy-like or aster-like. What page number are we starting to see? What page number are people getting? We have 382, 380, 382. Some people are trying to idea. Okay, you guys don't know what I'm responding to because I'm hearing Paige over there. She's telling me what your answers are. So I'm hearing a lot of 382s. There's one 380. Um, I would say looking at this leaf margin here, it's um, just, it's kind of toothed, but it's not very deeply lobed and it's certainly not divided. So let's go with um, leaves toothed and we'll get to page 382. Um, and then let's see, oops, I didn't have it there. I thought I had a picture of the page. So let's go to page 382, everybody. And um, I meant to put this in here, but I'll hold it up to the webcam. So I think we're pretty much there. We've got those three um, species at the bottom um, that are all in the genus Erigeron. Uh, and uh, let's see if we can get close to um, uh, what the actual one is. I'll tell you that the flowers themselves are just probably a little over a half inch wide. So that would rule out the robin's plantain. So we're between the common fleabane and the daisy fleabane. And if you look at the number of rays, um, I actually counted the rays and there were 88 in the flower that I counted. So I think that puts us in the category of our daisy fleabane um, or our annual uh, fleabane called Erigeron annuus. Is that what other people got? Yay! Okay, so this is a sweet little weed. It's a native plant. It has wind-blown um, seeds, and so it'll pop up in your garden sometimes. Um, I'd encourage you maybe to let some of it grow. It makes a nice cut flower. It also attracts hoverflies the larvae of which eat aphids. So if you're a gardener and you don't like aphids, let a little bit of daisy fleabane grow in your garden. Oops, I went backwards instead of forwards. I'm just all over the place with this thing tonight. Okay, botany break, how are we doing? So, quick question, how do you count the rays? <laughs> how do you count the rays? Well, she loves me, she loves me not. No, I, I'm just kidding, I didn't go quite that far. So what I did, I'm gonna see if I can, um, my mouse is not cooperating with me right now. Okay, so um, if we go back to this, what I did is I, I found this little gap right here and I counted 10 of those rays over to about here. Um, and then I figured that was about an eighth of the flower. So I just estimated that it was 88. Then I zoomed in on the picture and I counted everything I could see and it, it came to 88 exactly. So that's how, how I did it. Um, and you can develop your own method if you want. Uh, any other questions? No, we have people trying to ID the numbered plants. I just remind those to keep those to your side. Oh, um, yeah. Some people are putting the names of the numbered uh, mystery plants up in the chat. Um, please keep those to yourselves until we release the answers. Um, and then you can you can post on Facebook about how many of them that you got right. Okay. Other than that, we're good to go. Okay, so we're going to move ahead. Um, we're going to start accelerating a little bit, and one of the reasons I'm uh, going to do that with you is that there are some tricky bits that we're going to be troubleshooting here, and so we're going to skip past the parts that you already know how to do and get into some of the nitty-gritty. So um, I already identified that this plant of the day, uh, number three, is group 732, and that we should find it on page 368. But I want, to, I want you to look at some of its characteristics first. Um, you can t what, what plant family do you think this one is in? Should we see that in the chat maybe? Okay, so type that in while we look at some of the other characteristics. Um, we have along those stems, the leaves are coming off singly, so they are alternate. Uh, many of the leaves are basal as well. You can't see that that well in this picture. Um, and if you pick those leaves, they have a really an interesting characteristic. They're coarsely hairy. And I wish I could let you feel them. Botany is a, really a multi-sensory experience. Um, but if you look at the back of that leaf, it has really a characteristic vein pattern that may help us out later. So we have composite, aceraceae, or two most common answers. Composites and aceraceae, the most common answers, answers, and I agree with you entirely. Wonderful. So um, we're going to troubleshoot the idea of this plant because uh, when we go to page 368 for this, this is where we ought to end up, um, I'm not seeing it. So, and I don't see anything that look, really looks similar. So um, there are some categories toward the middle of the page that talks about um, 
flowers of, of, of the colors that would, would fit this, white, pink, blue, violet, or purple flowers, and daisy-like or aster-like in heads, greater than a half an inch wide. That seems right. Blooming in the early summer sounds right. Raised, though, look like they might be less than 40. So it doesn't really fit this, the top one here. Um, if you look at the description for flea veins, which we just identified, it doesn't look like one of those. Um, but, hmm, maybe we could just try this page 382 and see if there's anything there that helps us. Um, so Newcombs is going to give you some alternatives and, and help you with some of this troubleshooting. Um, so look at those, uh, those alternative um, page numbers. So if we go to that, if you look at the top of the page that the flea veins are on, there's something that looks a lot like our plant. Maybe not quite. The leaves aren't the right shape. They're, they have a, a sharper tip to them and a tooth. But maybe we've got the same genus. So we're going to use one of our web resources to check this out. So we're going to this time go to Minnesota Wildflowers. I'm going to walk you through the steps of how we're going to use that first before we go there. But if you have your smartphone out, go. You know, take off. Um, there we're going to find the plant name search bar. And we're going to type in echinacea and we're going to see um, where that leads us. So I am going to go to Minnesota Wildflowers and switch my screen. So we will be looking at the same thing together. It's a little bit clunky. Oh, they do ask for a donation and, um, uh, and it's, a, it's a great site. I use a lot. I should give them more money. Um, here we go. Echinacea. I've done this before, so it's, it's ready again. We'll search and look at the three choices. Can you tell me which one you think is closer to our plant, the, the left, um, middle, or right? And put that in the chat, please. Middle. middle. <laughs> A lot of people are saying middle. Um, and let's click on Echinacea pallida. Wow, does this look a lot like our plant. This is pale purple coneflower. Um, and I just want to highlight some of the information that you fi can find on this amazing site. So um, we can uh, click on the images and get uh, big pictures. We can flip through the images there on that site and see um, many different contexts for that plant and different parts of the plant. Um, we could read through these descriptions. Um, one thing I'd like to point out is for the leaves, there are three distinct veins along the length of a leaf, and we looked at that characteristic before. Another place that's really important on this is in the notes, it's going to tell you um, uh, some of the ways to tell this from things that it's similar to. So it's going to list other members of the genus and give you some characteristics that are going to help you make a quick choice between those. Um, and over in the right hand side, under plant information, you get a wealth of info. And one of my favorite parts of this is that you get a national distribution map, which is to the county level. And so you can see that this is a plant that is definitely present in many counties of Iowa, or has been identified from many counties in Iowa. So, um, wonderful site. Pale purple coneflower it is. We have our, um, our plant number three. Um, we are going to go back. I'll go back to the PowerPoint and I'll show you how we got there. So um, we had gone through the book and we found that it didn't fit anything on page 368. So we went to page 382 based on a hint that we had on page 368. And when we get to page 382, the top right picture is um, a flower that looks a lot like ours, but not quite. And so we thought it might be in the same genus, Echinacea. Does that make sense? OK, I hope that helps. Um, you can uh, give Paige a, uh, a yes or no with it. OK, so we did this, and we got that, and we got Echinacea pallida. OK. So um, one question that came up in one of the earlier lectures was what are grasses and forbs? And you know that Newcombs doesn't cover grasses, so we're going to dive a little bit into some families of grass-like plants. Um, to start out with, that there's a term for all the grass-like plants that's graminoids. It's kind of like when you, when you find a humanoid alien in Star Wars or something that's a humanoid, and graminoids are like the, the grains or the grasses. These have in common things like long blade-like leaves and very inconspicuous flowers. 
So I took this picture recently of a, of a grass that is in bloom. So grasses, we don't think of them as flowering plants, but they really are. They have the, all the, the sexual parts of a plant, the stamens and the pistil, they just don't have showy petals because they're wind pollinated. They don't need to attract insects. So if you look at this picture, you can see lots and lots of stamens. They're just kind of dangling on a little thread and blowing that pollen out into the wind. So, <laughs> you know, chew. And uh, um, that's uh, my attempt at a fake sneeze. Um, they also have very, if you zoom really close into those flowers, they have um, fuzzy stigmas that basically comb the wind for pollen from other grass plants. There are two important families within the, gr the group of graminoids that we're going to cover tonight, the sedges and the grasses. And then forbs are basically anything that's a, um, not a shrub or tree or a graminoid. They are often broadleaf plants and they often have showy flowers, but there are exceptions to anything. So we're going to jump into the sedge family right now, or the Cyperaceae. And one of the first things that most people learn when they're, when they're learning the botany of sedges is that, is that sedge stems have edges. If you can't see it, um, you can feel it. So um, roll a stem between your, your thumb and your forefinger and you'll feel that it's kind of like rolling a, a triangular prism there. You'll feel the edges. Likewise, the leaves come off the, the stem in on three sides. So they are considered in three ranks. And if you look at a plant from the top, you could draw a triangle across those leaves. The flowering structures of sedges, because graminoids are flowering plants, right? Um, the flowering structures are often these peculiar, either cylindrical or round to oval structures that'll be clustered together um, at the top of the stem or along uh, a, a branching stem. One really important genus in the Cyperaceae is the genus Carex. And these are um, revered and feared by uh, many expert botanists. If you get to the level where you can identify a Carex to the species level, we will issue you a green superhero cape. Um, in the meantime, you can identify a Carex as Carex spa. And for many years, even when I was a graduate student studying ecology, this was about the level that we would get to because we were looking at just the green leafy parts of sedges and we could not specify which species they were. So lots of my data sheets had Carex spa in it for unspecified sedge. In the grass family, we're actually gonna learn a couple of species. Um, but grass, um, all, grasses also have some common characteristics. Grass stems have knobby knees. They don't have edges. They are round to flattened in cross section. And their leaves come out on two sides of the stem. So they're in two ranks. So you can take a grass um, and if you pick it and you lay it down, it'll lay flat. The flowering arrangements of grasses are varied. Um, they can be anything from a tight spike to um, a raceme that has peduncles. Um, or to a panicle, which is like is taking racemes and sticking them together in the same, um, in the same uh, inflorescence or same flowering structure. Grasses are the dominant plants of prairies. So even though they're not a Newcomb's Guide, if we didn't teach you something about the grasses in this course, uh, we wouldn't be doing our job. So here we go. Big blue stem is the first one, and it's probably the most iconic grass of the tall grass prairie um, and one of the dominant grasses in many um, individual uh, remnant prairies. The flowering structure of this is often known as a turkey foot. It's basically a set of between two and six long um, finger-like spikes that together form something that looks a bit like a bird's foot. If you don't have flowering structures available, there are some hints you can use to try to identify a grass vegetatively, but this is a pretty um, high level task. Um, so uh, I would be cautious about any identifications that you do of grasses um, based on their vegetative structures at this point. Um, that being said, the stems of big blue stem are slightly flattened so that if you cut them, they would be an oval in cross section. And the blade and the sheath are often both have many longish hairs on them. When I was a grad student, actually, we kind of joked that um, to remember how to identify big blue stem, it looks like it has hairy legs. So um, it has hairs on the blades and hairs on the sheaths, and they're just kind of chaotic hairs all over the place. Um, if you remember back to Paige's lecture, she talked about the ligule as being a little structure that occurs at the collar right where the blade and the sheath uh, meet and wrap around the stem. And the ligule of big blue stem is short. It's about one to two millimeters, and it's just a little membrane. It's kind of soft. And this grass forms loose spreading clumps. It spreads underground, um, and it is a perennial grass that lasts for uh, many years and forms many stems. Um, it has very deep and interconnected, beautiful root systems. 
The next grass we're going to look at is Sargaster nutans. This is another of my favorites. I think this is one of the most beautiful grasses anywhere. Um, it has a flower structure that is a, a panicle that looks like a golden satiny feather. Um, and to see these, uh, a, a whole field with um, Indian grass waving in the fall is just gorgeous. The stems are round in cross section and the sheaths of the leaves are often furred with very neat short hairs. So they don't look like the hairy legs of, of um, big blue stem. They're just, they look like they've had a nice trim. Um, and then the upper leaf sheaths sometimes don't have any hairs at all. The ligule is one of the coolest things of Indian grass. And this is one where I hereby deputize you to identify um, a ligule or identify Indian grass, um, even if you're just learning, because it has a distinctive ligule. It's tall, it's very stiff, almost feels like fingernail texture, and it's notched at the tip. So it's a really cool identifying feature. The stems of Indian grass come up in bunches from the roots. So it's also perennial like big blue stem. They're a little bit tighter bunches than big blue stem. How are we doing? So we have a couple questions. Awesome. Um, first is, can you review how to count flower parts? Ah, so with um, counting flower parts, um, if there are um, just a few flower parts, I would just directly count them. It can be a little bit difficult if the flowers are small or if the parts are fused. And sometimes it can help to have a little magnifying glass in your pocket, um, or uh, if you have access to a microscope, even better. Um, and you can, if you have the plants have lots and lots of parts, then I would say estimate them um, and try to multiply by the uh, the number of the fraction that you've used to estimate. And then we have the question going back to the echinacea ID. Why mm -hmm. was it 732 if the leaves are four toothed? The leaves were not toothed. Um, so uh, the leaves on the um, the image of the echinacea in on the page were toothed. Um, but that was a different species of echinacea. So within a genus, they share some characteristics, but they're going to be a little bit different from each other if they're a different species. So what we had was echinacea pallida, or pale purple coneflower, which is not actually in Newcomb's guide. So we followed the key correctly. It just was not a plant that was in there. But Newcomb's gave us a hint, and then it gave us the genus, and we could use Minnesota wildflowers to take it from there. Excellent question. Love them. We have another couple questions, kind of the same concept. Mm -hmm. uh, what field guide do you use for ID grasses? That's a really good question. Um, uh, I have some old field guides on my shelf um, that I sometimes turn to. Um, there's one that's called Botany, uh, no wait, the, the, um, the Illustrated Guide to the uh, Iowa Prairie Plants has an excellent section on grasses. That's by Christensen and Miller. Uh, it's, uh, it's, and it's a wonderful guide. We could maybe post something about that on the, um, on the Botany resources. Um, the other thing is, I would say, use Minnesota wildflowers. They have an amazing section on grasses. Um, and they're going to get into some terminology and, and traits that may be a little bit difficult, but they also have lots of pictures and illustrations that can help you. Um, just another statement. Can you repeat the question before you answer it? Well, it Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I can hear Paige, but I forget that you can't hear Paige. So um, people were asking questions about the echinacea identification and about resources for identifying grasses. They want you to show the Indian grass picture. Oh, okay. Let me see if I get my mouse to cooperate. Yes. And um, is there a question about that or just want to look oh, at it? Um, another question is, how do you count the flowers? on something such as yarrow, each has such tiny flowers. How would you count that? Um, uh, with yarrow, uh, which, oh, sorry. Somebody was asking how to count the, the, the parts of something like yarrow that has very tiny flowers. Um, and my approach to that would be to take one of those little flowers out uh, from the rest. Find one that looks fairly representative and count the, the, the parts of that. Um, I think with yarrow, you can actually see it with the naked eye, um, but getting a little um, 10x magnifying um, uh, glass that, that folds up and you can put in your pocket called a loop, L-O-U-P-E, is a really good idea and that can help you count the parts of things that are very small. Also, if you have a good camera or a good cell phone camera, you can take a picture and you can zoom in and then you can look at those little tiny parts and count them more effectively. So take it apart or get a close-up image, I would say, would be, would be good approaches to that. By the way, um, that uh, yarrow was, was going to be one of our plants of the day, but I had to cut it because we're running out of time. 
last question is what are the defining characteristics of Forbes? Defining characteristics of Forbes is that they are not grass like. So they don't have um, long blade like leaves and inconspicuous flowers. Um, some of them have one of those characteristics, but not the other. So there are things like spiderwort that have long blade like leaves, but they have showy flowers. There are things like ragweed that have big, um, broad leaves, but they have um, inconspicuous flowers. So basically, Forb is a functional category that we use a lot, but it's, there's not really a great way to define it besides it's not a grass or a sedge. Um, one final question. We keep giving the question, what about rushes? Do they have edges? And I said, sedges have edges. Rushes are rushes round. Um, but just repeat that question okay. and go over rushes. Thank you, Paige, for reminding me to always repeat the question. I just can't get that. Um, so somebody asked about rushes um, and whether they also have edges. So um, the, the old uh, adage is that sedges have edges, but rushes are round. And so that's, um, that's, our, uh, that's a go-to. Um, I would hesitate to say um, always and every uh, for any of the answers that I give you tonight uh, because there's so much variation um, within uh, plants. But um, are we... Ready? Okay. By the time I learn to repeat questions, we'll be done with this whole thing, I think. Okay, the plant of the day number four is what we're ready to start with. And this one, um, I'm going to really take you through it rapidly because most of what this is about is, is troubleshooting. So we have um, a plant that's got very tight, its flowers and very tight heads or spikes. Um, and this is one of those where your question about how do you count things that are very small um, is, is right on. Um, I'm going to just say if you take one of these flowers out, you're going to find a tiny little regular five-part flower. If you look at its leaf arrangement, they are alternate. And if you look at the leaves themselves, they are divided. So this is group number 534. They're very small flowers and dense heads. Let's go to page 218 and see if it's there. And it doesn't look like anything on that page. And none of the alternatives that are on that page are going to help us with this one. So we are going to take this one straight out to Minnesota wildflowers, and we're going to troubleshoot that ID. Uh, so here we go. Okay, so we have here, um, we can't do a name search because we don't really even have a clue. So we're going to try this other thing. At the top of the um, Minnesota wildflowers page is a thing called advanced plant search. And we're going to take all those characteristics that we knew about that plant and we're going to type them in here and see what it yields. So we know it's a wildflower and that's already checked for us. We know that it had um, purple flowers. We know that the flower shape, I, I told you because you'd have to look at them very carefully, that it was five petals and regular, and that it was clustered in a very tight spike. We're going to look at its leaf attachment as being alternate and its leaf type as compound. That's the word that's mostly in use. Newcomb's use is divided, but compound is more commonly used. And we know that it was blooming in June. That's when, I, uh, that's when uh, that picture was taken. So we're going to hit search at the bottom of the page. There's a little button that says search. And we're going to hit that and we're going to see what emerges. And what we get is Dahlia purpurea or the purple prairie clover. And um, right off the bat, I'm going to let you know, you can search out the information here, but this is our identification for our um, plant four. So um, one thing that you can do is if it's not in Newcombs, you're not finding any hints in Newcombs, um, you can go to uh, Minnesota Wildflowers, work it through the advanced search with all of the traits that we knew, and click that search button, and you can um, find some options, or you can even narrow it down to the one that it is. So um, here's our next, our final troubleshooting sh um, guide for tonight is what happens if you find something it has no flowers. So I'm going to suggest a few strategies. I realize we're kind of on, we're on borrowed time here, um, but if you're, if you need to leave, you can leave um, and we'll have the recording posted for you. Um, uh, so strategies that you can use are first to look around and see if there are other plants in the area that are flowering that look very similar to the plant that you have. So here I saw a plant that had very unusual crinkly leaves. I looked around, I found one that was blooming and that gives me the flowers and then I can um, uh, work on that identification. 
you might also look for old stocks. Many prairie plants are perennial, so they grow from year to year. Um, the old stocks can give you hints about the types of flowering structures and the height of that plant that can help you identify it. The trick is making sure that what's below the plant, that you're below the old stocks is, is actually the thing that produced those old stocks. Another thing is just to wait and see. So you see that tantalizing little bud one week, um, you go back a few days later and you might see the actual flower that can help you with the identification. If you're working with a restored prairie um, and you have a seeding list, go to that, it'll narrow your options. And um, when we talk about remnant prairies, we'll also talk about habitat clues and identification. So we've learned today how to practice some more with Newcomb's Wildflower Guide, how to find current common and scientific names using the USDA plant site. We've learned how to recognize four different common plant families, which are illustrated on this page too. And I've given you some troubleshooting tips for what happens when Newcomb's doesn't work right away or if the plant isn't in Newcomb's. Um, and we learned four new species of the day. So a challenge for you this week is to just get out and explore. Find a member of each of the, the families that we learned about today, photograph and identify them, and share them to our Facebook group. I want to introduce our next speakers, and the next lecture topic is going to be on the plants of CRP um, fields and road sites. And Justin Meissen and Christine Nemec, my colleagues here at the TPC, will be leading um, that presentation. And just in closing, I um, wanted to say that um, feel, please feel free to ask additional questions. There are lots of ways to get a hold of us. The, uh, the Botany Beginners Facebook group is a great way. You can help answer each other's questions there. Um, and then advanced botanist, I will share the, the answers to those 15 mystery plants uh, soon. And I'd love to know how many of those you got. And I just encourage you to keep getting outside, keep exploring plants uh, and keep learning. It's a lifelong process. And with that, um, thank you very much. If there are other people, if people have questions, I'm happy to stay on and answer them. And, um, but to the rest of you, thank you very much for your attention and good news. A reminder for them, we posted the registrar for webinar four in the comments. Um, so if you want to repeat that to them, and also we have a question after you get done. Okay, um, Paige, just let me know that the um, registration link for um, for webinar four has been posted in the comments, so um, you can look for it there. Um, will it be also posted elsewhere? No, it will be posted on the website. It will also be available on um, the website and the Facebook group. So um, there are lots of ways for you to access the next webinar. Yes, and we have a question that says, how soon will this lecture be posted for review? Oh, um, how soon will this lecture be posted for review? Um, that's a really good question. We don't actually know the answer to that. That's in the hands of our IT department. Um, they're very busy this summer, and so they, they get ours um, ready for us and postable. Uh, as soon as they can, uh, but it could be several days before, um, before it goes up. Um, we have another question about plant of the day number one. Can you tell us what that was again? Plant of the day number one. Can I remember back that far? Oh, it was, um, yeah, it was, uh, that was Baptisia alba. Um, Newcomb's Guide lists that as Baptisia leucantha. And let me see, I'm going to go, nope, I'm not, I didn't want to start subtitles. What am I doing here? I wanted to go to, I'll just end the show. We'll go find our Baptisia. Nope, I, that stopped my screen sharing. I'm sorry. I closed that. We're going to reshare. Here we go. Now we're in business. Let me get my mouse to cooperate. And there's our Baptisia alba. And you can see where it is in Newcomb's guide on page 60. Any other questions? Um, cauliflower petals vary, some very narrow. Are they different species or just variations? Ooh, that's really, um, oh, <laughs> Paige just got me, she's keeping me honest. So um, uh, somebody mentioned that um, cone flowers vary, that there are some that have very narrow rays and some have um, wider rays. And is this, does this mean they're different species or is there just variation? Um, it's kind of a long answer. Um, the first part of that would be, yes, there's a lot of variation, uh, even within a species in cone flowers. Um, 
however, if you're, um, if you suspect that it might be a different species, I would suggest that you go to um, that Minnesota wildflower site and look at the three species of echinacea that are listed there um, and compare their characteristics. Uh, you might have to look at characteristics other than just the rays themselves, but look at the leaf arrangement and the leaf size and shape in order to help you narrow that down to see if it's uh, the same or different species. Um, I would say that purple coneflower, which we also see here and is commonly planted in gardens, um, does have wider rays that are not as um, not as elegantly dangly as those of uh, the pale purple coneflower. Uh, it also has more stem leaves, so that would be another um, characteristic that you could use to distinguish between those two. Does that help? Can you show plant four again? Plant of the day four. Plant of the day four. Let's see, that was way down here. Okay, yeah, so plant of the day number four was our Dahlia purpurea or purple prairie clover. And um, did you have a, did they have a question they about it or just wanted to see it? Yeah. Okay, um, that sounds good. Is there an ID guide for Iowa being developed? Specifically Iowa. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Is there an ID guide for Iowa being developed? Um, and you mean the, similar to the websites like Minnesota Wildflowers and Illinois Wildflowers? That's what I'm, I'm interpreting that question to mean. Um, uh, there um, is an Iowa Wildflowers site. I can't remember um, exactly what it's called. It's not as comprehensive and searchable as the Minnesota Wildflowers Guide. So as far as having a database that allows you to plug in the characteristics and give you a tentative identification, um, there's nothing I know of that's uh, as good as Minnesota Wildflowers. They currently on that site have something like 1,700 species, and they're aiming to have about 2,000 species um, on that database. Uh, so it's uh, extremely comprehensive. I don't know if there would be even a reason to do one that would be specific to Iowa. Um, Minnesota is a bit more diverse than us in, in terms of the types of um, habitat that they have, and uh, they're extremely diverse in their, uh, their flora. So most of what they have there is going to be, um, is going to overlap pretty well with ours. There's, there's, yeah, it's always going to leave some things out. It'd be awesome. Yeah, somebody take it on. Make it, make it, make it just as good as that one and make it for Iowa. I would love it. I'd be there every day. Um, someone asked, would you recommend the Minnesota Wildflower app instead of the site? I'm thinking about using it. I'm thinking I could use it offline. Oh, um, I haven't tried that yet. I've just used, oh, the question again. I just can't learn that. Um, somebody asked about the app versus the, um, using the website um, through your browser uh, and thought that maybe you could use the app offline and take it with you out in the field. Um, it's an excellent question. I don't know the answer to that. I would encourage you to try that and uh, find out how it works. And um, if it does or doesn't, post about it on the Facebook group. I'd love to know. Um, can you go back to what you challenged them to do? Um, I ch oh, yeah, I was kind of cr uh, crunching through that pretty fast, wasn't I? Uh, so my challenge to you is to go out and explore and find one member of each of the families that we learned about today. And then photograph them, work them through the identification, however, whether it's newcoms or using some of the online resources, and then share it with the rest. Who created the Minnesota Wildflower? Oh, that's a good question. I think they have a wonderful about us. Oh, the question. Who created the Minnesota Wildflowers um, site? Um, uh, I don't remember the names. I've read their about information, but they do have an excellent section about the, the organization um, and the people who are involved in it. So um, it really is, uh, um, it's, it's just a, it's a wonderful organization. They have their heart in the right place and they're doing great work. Can you go over the four plant families that we covered today? Just name them all. Oh, just name, uh, can I name the four plant families that we covered today? Um, first, we covered um, the pea family, which is also known as the legumes or the fabaceae. Um, then we looked at the composites. Um, which are also known as the Asteraceae, um, and variously like Aster or the sunflower family or the daisy family. Um, then we did the sedge family or the Cipheraceae, and the grass family or the Poaceae. James Cronin says that he has a Cipheraceae gene for Iowa, if anyone is interested. 
<laughs> James Cronin says he has a super race AE key for Iowa in case anyone is interested. And um, uh, uh, me, me, James, please send one to me. <laughs> so I think you can find my email on the, the Tall Grass Prairie Center face, uh, the, uh, website. <laughs> um, we have our, probably our last question. And it says, do you have a rec recommendation for learning the pronunciation of botanical names Ooh. and the rule of pronunciation? <laughs> I love this. Oh, okay. I have to say the question. Um, somebody has uh, asked if there, if I have recommendations for the pronunciation of the scientific names and the rules for that. And I say there's one rule, and that is to say it with confidence, because these are um, sort of Latinized names, but they're not really Latin. So if you know some Latin, great. If you know Spanish, the vowels are going to be pronounced similar to this Spanish. But I might say Dahlia. You might say Dahlia. I might say Schizocurium. You might say Schizocurium. You might say Leatrice. I say Leatrice. Whatever it is, it, we will know what we're talking about. Communication is about knowing what each other is talking about, and that's going to work. So look at it, sound it out, see how it sounds to you, and then say it with confidence, and you'll be right. James says it's $10 to say that. Uh, uh, James Cronin says the Cipheracity e Guide is um, $10. So um, maybe just for you, I don't know. Oh. I don't know if it's ten dollars forever. Just for me? Oh my goodness. Okay, I'm there. Never mind. Okay, Paige, to tell me that's that's all the the questions that we have time for for today. I really appreciate all of them. It was really fun to have that um, that interaction with you, and uh, love to see you on the Facebook group. Bye, everybody.